will have a unit exam, lecture, and lab. So our first exam is a week from today, Tuesday, Happy Valentine's Day. Um, and it will cover everything from the very first day of class, including that material that we've had, the intro quiz. All right? Um, but that will be about the first oh, 15 questions or so out of 72. Um, so if you had trouble with some of that, I've opened it up so that some of that material is available as we do it. All of the quizzes have closed. You can go back and review those questions. Um, so if it was the cell that you had trouble with or some of the tissues, uh, relationship terms or whatever. Um, then the rest of the material will be what we didn't have the intro quiz on, which is the skin through bone. Right? Although we've had four days, we'll have had four days or so on bone, three days on that whole bone identification. There's a lot of bones and there's a lot of parts to the bones. Okay, so there's plenty of material uh, to take that from. So um, that will be the um, lecture component of it. And I've given you some ideas about how to, what types of questions. You'll see more ideas on the quizzes, which is why it's a good idea to take them more than one time, even if you're happy with the first score. Um, then in lab, so whatever time you have lab, we'll have a lab exam, okay? Um, you'll have the full hour and 15 minutes where we have for the lecture, and I usually let students go because we have 15 minutes between maximum time is five minutes after because they start standing outside. They're usually very patient, but I'll um, require that the exams be turned in by 10 miles. Because I have to get over and do the lab exam at night. Um, so you'll need a Scantron, all right, one of the 882 versions it's listed in the lecture notes. Um, and when you come in, I'll ask that you leave your backpacks along the side front or back of the room so they're not at your desks. And um, just have something to write with. Your cell phone should be turned off, not even on vibrate, because that itself can be, um, people listen and wait and see where it is, see if it's their own backpack. Um, and if you're wearing hats or a hood, you could, you know, I understand bad hair days, especially like this morning, because um, I don't own an umbrella. And just turn it around so that the rim is facing to the back, okay? Because I need to see your eyes. Same thing if you have a hoodie, leave it off. Um, knit hats are fine. I just want to be able to see your eyes. And uh, so backpacks and cell phones and gear and stuff off to the side and uh, the hats, and then there'll be a sheet to sign, um, kind of listing my expectations. And I'll remind you of this the morning of the exam, but a few of you, there were about 10 quizzes, 10% 10 of the lecture quizzes in which students had forgotten, um, I'm assuming they forgot, they do it on purpose to circle your lab time. Now that we're kind of settled with the class membership, um, the Lecture quiz sheets are not colored by labs, like the lab quizzes are. And so to sort them out, that's when I pass them back. So to sort them out, it really helps us to have your lab time circled. And on the lecture exam, there's information on the lecture exam that I want transferred to the Scantron. So your name, the um, lab that you're in, and there's several different versions of the exam, so whatever letter, version A, B, C, D, or G, F, H, I, whatever I have on it, that needs to go on the scan truck, okay? And I've been increasing penalties for people that don't, because it takes me about a half an hour, extra hour or so, to go back and find what lab they're in or what key they're in, so I can even run the Scantron and I need to know what key they're using, and I have to go back and find the lab, the lecture exam, and so on. And so there are an additional seven questions from the 72 questions, seven of them are extra points. So I divide by 65. So at first I just dropped off one percentage point. So if you got 82, you got 81 for forgetting. That didn't help. Um, and then um, I've been dropping it further. So this time on the, 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 the um, directions, you forget any part of that. All right, if you get to circle on the la a lecture exam or write it on the Scantron or whatever. And I actually put it up on the screen, everything in red that needs to be done. And there's still about five people that forget every exam, okay? I'm not quite sure <laughs> what to do. Um, but last semester, I was putting stuff away in the mailbox and I saw something from another instructor who was just a straight 10 points off. That's essentially without any extra credit, okay? 
65 questions and seven points additional is a little more than 10 point, 10 percent. Um, so it'll just be a 10 percent drop. So hopefully that will help you. Um, remember, my daughter is in uh, junior at Colorado State, and she said, "Boy, you're a nice, mom." And I said, "What do you mean?" And she said, "Well, my teacher won't even grade the exam." We don't put all the information on it. So I said, well, they've done the work. I feel like I should at least grade it. So I'll remind you of that. It will be up here in red, everything you're supposed to do. Uh, so just an encouragement to, those are easy points not to lose. So that's a week from today for lecture, all right? In lab, I'll talk about the lab exam, but we have models and bones and stuff on the stations, and you will go from station to station like the not fun Congo line without the music. Um, identifying the structure. So it'll be like the quiz and the essence that you'll write the answer down, okay, um, on the answer sheet. Um, that's about, we have 27 stations, unless we have more students, so it's about double, 54 to uh, 55 minutes is what that will take. So if we start on time, 9 o'clock, 9.05, you're usually out of there um, by 10.05 or 10.10, 10, okay? And that gives me enough time to change the questions around. I don't change the models, but I do move the questions from one um, group to the next. All right, so today we're doing the upper extremity for the appendicular axoskeleton was pad vertebra rib cage sternum. And so we're doing appendicular today and on Thursday. And we start with the upper extremity. So notice, if you didn't, I'll point out, I use the term upper extremity rather than arm. Anatomically, those are different structures. So the arm is going to be from the shoulder to the elbow. And we call the region from the elbow to the um, hand, the forearm. So there's only one bone in the arm, and that's the humerus. The radius and ulna are bones of the forearm. We'll do the same thing when we get to the lower limb, that's the lower extremity. And leg is knee to ankle, or knee to foot, okay? The femur is in the thigh, so both the upper um, extremity with the arm and the lower extremity of the thigh have just one bone in that region, and the forearm and the leg have two bones. Okay? So, do they want to pick up quick questions? We have our first two questions right off the bat. So, question number one is name any bone which forms the medial wall of the orbit of the eye. Question one, name any bone which forms the medial wall of the eye. Question number two has two parts. So the first part is name the bone which contains this opening. So what is the name of that bone? And then the second one is name the nerve that passes through that opening. All right, so we're in the skull is turned upside down. And here would be the depression of the joint surface for the mandible. It's a big bump right here and a sharp, pointy structure here. So the opening at the base of that, what's the nerve that passes through that opening? All right, so we finished up looking at the sternum and the ribs on Thursday. Remember we had the manubrium and the body, our gladiolus and the xiphoid process. And we had identified two ribs attachment. So I kind of drew this like a t-shirt and we have the first rib, and that really tiny weird looking bone that I showed you in lab, uh, is attached via cartilage here, that would be hyaline cartilage. And the second rib is attached at this surface right here, that line being the sternal angle. What attaches to the top portion here, almost the shoulder-like area, is the clavicle. Okay. That is a movable joint. You can raise your shoulders up and drop them. Um, and there's actually a fibrocartilaginous disc, similar to what we have 
um, between the femur and the tibia. Um, although fibrocarditis cysts are usually to support a lot of pressure, um, you would think that that's a lot of pressure there. But essentially, your entire upper extremity is attached to the axial skeleton at that surface. Okay? So if you break your clavicle, the whole upper limb is going to droop. There are certain muscles that will attach the scapula to the ribs um, and so on, but as far as bone to bone, the entire upper extremity is only attached at that surface. It's not a ball and socket joint. It's the two bones actually just kind of rest. There's that fibrocartilaginous disc. And then there's ligaments that wrap around it and attach it. It's not a real uh, key and a keyhole type of component. So we call the two bones from which the um, upper extremity is suspended. Those two bones together form the pectoral girdle. All right. So we have the pelvic girdle for the hips. And we have the pectoral girdle, excuse me, pectoral girdle for the upper extremity. Pectoral referring to the scapula, or rather, to the chest, pectoral referring to the chest. So that first bone has this double S curvature. Clavicle means little T. I also must have thought it looked like a ivory key on a keyboard. And so the challenge in lab, it's not difficult, that was actually, is to figure out whether you're looking at a left one or a right one. And so if you have the online lecture notes for any of the bones that I want you to learn left or right, I give you clues on how to do that. There's usually two steps. Find the top and the bottom in this case, find the front and the back, anterior and posterior surfaces, um, and then relate it to that. So this is the superior surface. This is what's gonna be facing upward, right, towards the ceiling. And you'll notice it's rather smooth compared to the bumps and ridges that we see on the inferior surface. So practice identifying when we get to lab whether this, whether this is a, your particular clavicle is left or right in your bone box. Now you'll notice that it curves from the sternum back to the scapula. So we look at two ends and we have to, once we identify the superior and inferior surfaces by the smoothness, um, then you need to decide which one is medial and which one is the lateral end. So if I take my dry erase pen here, and that's the clavicle without the curvature, and I step on this end with <coughs> my heel, say it's clay, and I flatten it horizontally, that is going to be the acromial end, or the lateral aspect, where it articulates with the scapula, okay? If I then, notice how this is flattened vertically already? That's what rests on the surface of the sternum. So the space between those two vertical ends creates this indentation here. See how that's kind of flattened vertically on each side? And that deepens the top of the maneuver and we call that the juggler notch. The reason that's so deep right there is because of the gap between the two clavicles rather than because of the deep indentation. It's not that deep an indentation in the manubrium by the time we add the sternal ends. So sternal end or sternal extremity, what we would, if I were to tag that, so that has a vertical approach, this has a horizontal approach, all right? Next step is you want to place that curvature where it goes away from your neck. So if I were to draw the two clavicles, it would be the sternum, and you're looking down from the top. Exaggerating it here. So it's kind of like a collar, okay? rounded collar that a blouse might have or the pointed collar that a guy would wear. So that's gonna go away and then back to your shoulder, okay? So first of all, you're going to determine whether it's the superior or inferior component. And on the inferior aspect, there's two rough areas I want you to be able to identify. The costal tuberosity, the small rough area that's for muscle attachment, all of, both of these are. And it's near the sternal and costal meaning rib, all right, so that's gonna be near are these ligaments and muscles will attach to. So right there would be the costal uh, tuberosity. And then the conoid tubercle is a longer ridge-like rough area that's on the acromial end. So costal is medial, conoid tubercle, tubercle is lateral, right? So place those so they're facing the floor. And then what you want to do is um, take that and flip it one way or the other so it's in the appropriate orientation, okay? So you can see with this double curvature, I could take it like this or I could flip it over like this. That's why you have to determine which is the superior and which is the inferior surface first. 
So if I de decided that this is the superior, the top of the clavicle, I could hold it like this, or I could rotate it around and hold it like this. It'd still be sternal to scapular. So now you have to look at the curvature and place it so the curve is away and then back, okay? Rather than here going back and coming forward. So that's how I would use the orientation for that aspect. This double curvature provides some strength to the clavicle. However, it's still one of the most commonly broken bones in the body. It breaks with lateral force. All right, so slamming into the wall or the floor um, on your shoulder, fomeal end, um, can often snap that. You can see its position here. This is the acromion process of the scapula. So here's a bump created by a fractured clavicle. Um, typically, it's not casted. Um, the arm is supported because that's going to drag it down and change the shape. So usually the arm is supported in a sling. It's kind of like pelvic fractures are usually not casted either. Um, my mom broke her clavicle. She was driving. I was moving from California back to Tennessee after I got my doctorate and over Thanksgiving break. Had a really bad cold and she had flown out to help me drive. So the day after Thanksgiving, we were in Albuquerque and she said, take your cold medication, sleep it off and I'll drive. And I woke up, that was 11. I woke up at noon because we were on the rough area of the shoulder on the freeway, you know how it's close to wake you up. Uh, so I woke up, looked over at my mom and she was asleep. At least she had her eyes closed. So I said, mom, and that woke her up. She said she wasn't asleep, but she just had um, cataract surgery. And she said her eyes were tired, so she grabbed the wheel and we went across five lanes of traffic. And then that wasn't the way she wanted to go. She grabbed the wheel and we went the other direction. We did that two or three times and we were on cruise control uh, at about 63 miles an hour. My mom never wore her seatbelt. And I refused to show her how to even turn the car on until she put her seatbelt on. Finally, when we were heading off to the side, and there were 500 foot cliffs in the mountains east of Albuquerque, she let go. And so we went off the side of the freeway at 63 miles an hour. Fortunately, it was only a 20 foot drop instead of 500. It was down an embankment with a small grove of pine trees at the bottom, which she didn't want to hit. So she took the wheel back again and started to turn the car. Well, you're going down like this at 63 miles and you turn up. The centrifugal force keeps you going. And we flipped two and a half times, um, broke the rear axle on the driver's side and broke her clavicle and landed upside down in our seatbelt. So I was very grateful that I had required that she put her seatbelt on because that was the only physical damage to our bodies was her broken clavicle. Um, and she didn't get a cast. My oldest son broke, fell down our stairs three times. Um, he was actually pushed once. My husband knocked him down the first time. Um, <laughs> we had seven foot wide, 13 stairs that were carpeted. That's why he bought the house we, uh, just before we were married. And there was not much landing at the top when he stepped out of our master bedroom. And so he had stepped out and Chris was standing about 11 months, standing right behind him, and went log rolling down the stairs. Of course, you know, we were running after him. He was fine. Um, the next time he was about two, and a friend who I'm staying with now, her two daughters were trying to teach him to climb the stairs, which he already knew. And in the confusion, he went down the stairs again. Fine. Then he was three, and he came out of our bathtub and came running around the corner through the doors with his wet feet and did another log roll. Um, about five days later, the babysitter said, you know, Chris was sitting on the floor and he fell over onto his shoulder and started to cry. And I said, well, he should be hurting by now. So I took him into the doctor. And she said, look, you can feel a bump right here where the callus is forming. You remember what tissue forms the callus as the bone is being knitted together? Fibro cartilage. Okay. And um, she said, I'm not going to put him in a cast or anything, you know, just... Uh, I said, well, he goes to daycare in the morning, preschool. Should I tell the teachers not to let, let him climb around on the monkey bars? And she said, no, just don't throw him down the stairs again. <laughs> Which is where I always sat to get him dressed. So for the next almost year, he would yell at the top of his voice, don't throw me down the stairs, Mom, every morning. <laughs> so the first two times, the clavicle was primarily highland cartilage. Okay? And then as it was replaced by bone, it became more dense and more brittle. And so the third time was why he fractured it and not the first two times, because it had primarily been converted to bone by that time. All right, so question number three. Is this end here 
and it's flattened horizontally, okay? Is it the acromial end or the sternal end? First part of that question, and on the same line, you can choose an R and L. Is it a right clavicle or a left clavicle? So each of these questions is 50% chance of getting it right, so both questions you have 25% chance if you're purely, purely guessing, but fortunately you get to figure it out. Okay, so the circled end is the end that's flattened as if you were to step on it with your heel. Want to draw it on your quiz sheet on the back and flip it around like I did with this piece of paper? That might be helpful since you don't mentally, that's kind of hard to do with the picture. We'll talk about what part of the brain you use to do that when we get to the nervous system. The first thing you want to do is are you looking at the inferior surface or the superior surface? and decide which is medial and which is lateral, and then rotate it one way or the other to fit. All right, so the clavicle articulates with the scapula, Layman's term for scapula is the shoulder blade. You've heard of that term before. And we have both an anterior and a posterior view. The anterior view is that view that's facing towards the front of your body, all right? It's going to be separated by muscle, but it's going to be, if you just have the articulated skeleton and no muscle, it's going to be what's facing the ribs. <coughs> so we have a medial border, which is facing the midline of the body. That would be the spine, spinous surface here. That's pretty straight, and then it angles laterally. So this is going to be medial lateral. And then on the lateral surface, we have one of two joint surfaces. This is known as the glenoid fossa or cavity. And it's a joint surface. It's going to articulate with the head of the humerus. Okay. It's our first ball and socket joint, although this is a rather shallow socket, medial border, inferior angle. I think the online lecture notes may say inferior border, there is no inferior border, it's just an inferior angle, lateral border, and then we have the superior border here, with the divot for nerves that pass to the muscles along the back, called the suprascapular notch. But like most of our foramina, although it's not complete, it's for the passageway of nerves and or blood vessels, and in this case, it's both. And then we have an anterior process. Kind of sticks out like this. You can feel it right here. Okay. It's a muscle attachment known as the four-point process, which means beak. Now, here's a place where the, a letter makes a difference. So the sharp process of a mandible was called the coronoid process. All right, we have another coronoid process on the, our ulna. This is coracoid. You need to make sure you differentiate between the C and the N. <coughs> this entire smooth surface, um, this is also for uh, muscle. Not also, but it is for muscle. This entire smooth surface here is known as the sub fossa. Also, for muscle, as we'll see in our next unit, there's a muscle by that name, subscapularis. <laughs> and then the other joint surface is difficult to see because it's a posterior, but it's going to be a, um, an expansion 
I'll show you on a post here, if you notice the acromion or acromial process. And that's where the clavicle is articulating. Okay. So I'm going to flip this over. It's going to be I'm gonna, the same bone. I'm just flipping it over as if I'm turning a, a page over. It looks very similar. We have the same medial, inferior angle, and lateral borders. But now we have an expansion that separates this surface into two fossa. So there's a ridge here known as the spine of the scapula. This is the acromion or acromial process we've been talking about. And again, primarily a joint surface. So this is where the acromial end of the clavicle is going to rest. Again, it's just like the two bones touch each other. There's not much of a depression or like the mandibular fossa and the mandibular condyle. So again, we have our glenoid fossa or cavity. Our suprascapular notch. And so the spine separates the posterior surface into the infraspinous fossa. and the supraspinous fossa. Supra meaning above, infra meaning below. So everything I have it marked with a joint is a muscle attached. Okay, the spine. We have supraspinatus muscle and infraspinatus muscle. All right, so again, um, lab is gonna be primarily naming the process and the bone. And Occasionally, not every single question, but on several questions, I will have a second part to it. Is this a side of muscle attachment or a joint surface? Can you just circle M or J? Okay. However, in lecture, additional types of questions would be of the relationship positions. So the subscapular fossa is on what surface of the bone? Yes? Um, so is the supraspinous fossa below the pressure on the top, right? Uh-huh. Yeah, it's on the, so if you think of this as a ridge, it's on the superior aspect of that. It's a slight um, kind of curved area. So um, subscapular fossa is on the anterior surface of the uh, scapula. Or I might list a bunch of bones and say, which of the following bones or processes is lateral in its position? So the glenoid fossa, the acromion, and the coracoid process are all going to be lateral. Um, or the acromion is which of the following? Well, it's a, it's a posterior, it's a posterior and lateral process. So as you diagram these, feel them, and the bones that you're studying are looking at images of them. Don't just be able to name them, but be able to visualize them and draw them. All right, um, so that you can visualize their um, locations. All right, so the clavicle and the scapula together. I guess I don't have the name of the bone up there. I'll put it up there. Form a pectoral girdle. The clavicle is attached to the manubrium by ligaments and is attached to the acromion of the scapula by ligaments. Yes. And that is from the um, that's from the glenoid fossa and up? Yeah. So this is the lateral border of the scapula. And it makes sense if the if it's gonna form a joint with your upper extremity bones and it has to be on the outside or lateral aspect of the bone. Yeah. Um, because on this surface, there's no bony yeah. component for the scapula. Let me show you a picture of the scapula from a lateral view. So this entire flat portion of the scapula is known as the body. So if I just write that up on the board, so I'm never going to ask for that. I say name this process or surface, I want either subscapular fossa or infraspinous fossa. Okay? So the subscapular fossa is on the anterior aspect along with the coracoid process. And the infraspinous fossa, spine, supraspinous fossa are on the posterior aspect. 
So here's what I was diagramming. Okay. But this picture helps you to see kind of that uh, depression that forms the supraspinous fossa above the spine. <coughs> All right, so the bone that, other bone that articulates with the scapula is the single bone of the upper extremity. take out the middle piece of the diaphysis so I can put both the proximal and distal in. So again, um, anterior view here. We have the head of the humor. And that is a joint surface. It's going to articulate with the lenoid fossa. So both of those surfaces are going to be covered with what type of tissue? It's regular connective tissue or hyaline cartilage? Hyaline, hyaline. hyaline cartilage, because they're a joint surface, right? Um, there's not much of a neck, uh, because you know, it's like a muscular guy that's been working out a lot and doesn't have much of a neck. We see a really long neck with the femur, but there's not much of a neck located here. And then we have two processes, bumpy areas that are raised, which are sites for muscle attachment. One is anterior, and one is lateral, okay? And these are known as tubercles. So this is a lesser tubercle. It's a uh, muscle attachment. It's lateral, sorry, anterior, and it's at the proximal closest to the joint. So we're right here on the front, okay? Right very close to the coracoid process of the scapula. This process, is known as the greater tubercle. And it's going to be lateral and proximal. The head would be what? Certainly proximal, medial or lateral. Medial, has to face medial in order to articulate with the glenoid fossil. fossil. So again, this is not something to memorize. It's a lot easier if you can visualize it. You see where it is, okay? You practice feeling the lesser tubercle on the anterior surface of your humerus. You know it's proximal. There it's anterior. The greater tubercle is lateral. Question? Uh, so the lesser tubercle is also lateral? Uh, no, it's anterior. Okay. A and T. Okay. There is a groove between the two tubercles created by uh, one of the tendons of your biceps brachii muscle. Um, as that tendon passes between that to go across over the head and attach to the scapula, and you keep using that bone, as the other muscles pull and create larger and larger, lesser and greater tubercles, that groove becomes deeper, kind of like a river running through a canyon. And so this face here is known as the inter- Now as we, all that's associated with the epiphyseal end of the bone, if we extend the shaft uh, more distally, you'll notice that on the lateral aspect is a roughened area, kind of starts out wide and tapers to a point. And what's the major muscle that caps your shoulder and its major function, although it can do flexion and extension, its major function is gonna move your humerus away from your body? Do abduction. Deltoid. Deltoid. So the site in which these deltoid muscle um, tendon fibers insert through the periosteum into the bone is identified as the deltoid 
tuberosity. Because it runs a good third of the way down, we're not going to say whether it's proximal or distal, but it's definitely lateral. Yes. I have a question. I know this is like, so like oh, diagnosis me, but um, in football, I kind of had like a little injury, and my right shoulder, mm -hmm. I'm taking a picture from behind, my right shoulder is lower than my left shoulder. Um, and I went to the like, trainer, and she told me it was because something happened somehow, like when it turned, when it got twisted back and forth, and um, my body had like slowly learned to not use like the scapula to move it, but mm -hmm. other, through other muscles in order to move it. So I'm wondering like how exactly did that happen? <coughs> So and when we, we when we do scapula. muscles from the scapula, all right, the uh, rotator cuff muscles that help you do lateral extension and some abduction cross from the infraspinous fossa. There's two from here that cross over and attach to the greater tubercle, and the supraspinous crosses over and attaches to the greater. That's mainly for doing this movement. The others are for doing this. So if it's your whole clavicle that's dropping, that's probably muscles up in the neck area. But if it's misuse of your mis disuse of your shoulder, then it's probably these muscles right here that are in the infraspinous fossa area. Because they would reach over and grab onto the uh, greater tubercle. And one of them, the, the, it looks like they're below the shoulder joint, but these fibers here can come pretty high, and these upper ones are almost lateral. Otherwise, any drooping is going to be weakness of muscles up in your neck. It also might have been stretching of the ligaments that form the deep to the rotator cuff tendons. Yeah, they do like twisted. Yeah, kind of that sounds more like, because muscle use you should get back unless there was nerve damage. Mm -hmm. And many nerves will grow back if they're away from the spinal cord, mm -hmm. um, but ligaments, as you recall, are really difficult to get to grow back. So if those are overstretched, that's going to be difficult to get the tightness back. Not to miss, I mean, I haven't seen yes, your no. MRIs or anything like that, but just understanding the tissues. Okay, so that's the proximal end. Now let's look at the, and there's nothing in posterior. It's a unique substance, okay? So anything you need to identify for the proximal end is anterior and lateral, right? So, our medial. So now let's move down to the distal end, and we do have significant anterior and posterior components of that. So still looking at the anterior view, the distal, near the elbow joint, you'll see that the, if you feel at your elbow, you'll notice that there is a flaring of the joint. So you'll feel two bumps just above your elbow. When you flex and extend your elbow, they don't move, which means they're not the radius and the ulna. They're part of your humerus. Okay? So, Again, this is going to be lateral, this is going to be medial because it's just an extension of this diagram. <coughs> we have a flaring on the lateral aspect, and we have more of a flaring on the medial aspect. So that bump is larger. These are known as epicondyles, or besides, around the condyle. So this is medial epicondyle. And this is the lateral. Now, both of these are muscle attachments. So if you feel that on the medial side, place your hand just distal onto the forearm and flex your wrist. Feel that muscle short, the muscles there shorten and get bigger. Almost all of the muscles that flex your wrist come from the medial epicondyles. We'll see in our next unit. Now, pronate your hand. Put your hand on the thumb side, which is the lateral aspect of your forearm. Now extend your wrist your wrist backward and you'll feel those muscles contract. So almost all your extensors of your wrist are going to attach to the lateral epicondyle. So this is how we're going to come back and use these muscle attachments. Do you have a question? Okay. You, you're just using, moving your hand. Um, use these muscle attachments um, processes when we look at the bony surfaces. So these are muscle surfaces, okay, muscle attachments. Then we have two joint surfaces. These are condyles, but we give them names, all right? So on the lateral aspect, we have a rounded surface. It looks a bit like a marble. Or it could look like a tiny little doll head made out of a wooden clothespin. 
And so that's given a term that means head, which is capitulum. Again, that's a joint surface, so it's going to have hyaline cartilage on it. The other joint surface is elongated, kind of like a pulley. You're at a well. Most pulleys are really narrow, but think of a wider pulley that has kind of a depressed area that the rope or the chain passes over. All right, so this reminded somebody of a pulley, and our word for pulley is troglia. So another joint surface. Two bones that these articulate with from the forearm are the radius and the ulna. And the radius is the lateral bone. All right. So we'll draw that in. articulates with the capitulum. Okay, it has a head as well that looks like a drum head. So the drum head articulates with the doll head. And when you flex your elbow, there's a little depression here that receives the head of the radius. Otherwise, there would be a, a it'd like get to a bump there and wouldn't go any farther because of the prod of that um, radial pad. So this depression is known as the radial fossa. That's not the major elbow joint. Your elbow joint that actually creates the force is between the humerus and the ulna. All right. Um, the ulna has a kind of a crescent shape, like a ridge top to it. I'm just going to draw the front part of it with this diagram. And it has a pointed surface to which the muscle attaches that moves the ulna. And so that pointed surface also needs a depression in which to fit. Otherwise, you won't be able to completely decrease the angle of your joint. So there's another depression here. And that sharp part of the ulna has the same name as the sharp part of your mandible. So we have the mandibular condyle, and then it dropped down to create a notch, and it came up again to a point, and that was the coronoid process of the mandible. Well, this is the coronoid process of the ulna, and so this fossa is called the coronoid fossa. Okay. Named for an ulnar process, but it's found on the all right, so lateral processes are lateral epicondyle, capitulum, and radial fossa. Those are all lateral. Um, radial fossa would be anterior as well, and they're all distal. Okay. The lateral epicondyle, the capitulum, is neither anterior nor posterior, because we can see it on both sides, but they're certainly both, both lateral. And then immediately we have the coronoid fossa, the troclea, and the medial epicondyle. So if all you can see is the distal end of the humerus, you can tell which is me medial and which is lateral by either these processes, where's the capitulum, where's the trochlea, or just by looking at the medial epicondyle, the bump that sticks out the farthest. Now let's flip it over. And look at the posterior distal end of the humerus. So if I flip it over, which end is going to, which side is going to be medial if I'm turning it over? Now it's going to be on this side. So I'm turning it over, all right? So 
There's the medial epicondyle and the lateral epicondyle, make it a little bit more of a bump. And now the um, capitulum and hopefully you're on the opposite side, but we don't see the capitulum very well. All right. Essentially what we see is just a bit of the trochlea and not much of the capitulum. So here is the trochlea. Medial epicondyle. And lateral epicondyle. Feel this big bump back here? That belongs to your ulna. Okay? Remember I said the ulna was like a big crescent ridge? So that big bump has to fit so that you can extend your elbow. It has to fit into a depression of the ulna, just like the head of the radius and the coronoid process needs some place to fit into. So we have a large depression on the posterior surface of the humerus that receives the olecranon process, which I'll show you in just a moment. So this is known as the olecranon fossa. So because the olecranon itself is a process of another bone, and the coronoid is process is part of another bone, you don't get any credit if you, unless you give me the term fossa or process, okay? Because I want you to know, I want to know that you know it's a depression versus a bump. So just saying it's olecranon, I don't know if you're talking about the fossa or the process. So you need to include for the humerus the word fossa for that depression, and if we're talking about the ulna, the word process. So that's the whole word, the part of the... Mm -hmm. of the we'll be looking at that in just a moment, and I'll, I'll show it to you. Your bowl, um, view. Here's the head, lesser tubercle, greater tubercle, and in, right here would be the intertubercular groove. And all of this rough surface down here, not just here, but all this rough surface down here, is the deltoid tuberosity. You don't need to worry about the radial groove, that's for the radial nerve as it winds around the bone. Okay? And then we get down to the distal end. Let me bring that up and make it a little bit larger. On the anterior view, here's the capitulum and the radial fossa. Here's the trochlea and the coronoid fossa. On this side, you can see that it's difficult to see the capitulum over here. You just see a little bit of a bump. Here's the trochlea, and here's the olecranon fossa. So in lab, when you practice identifying whether a bone is left or right, the first thing you need to do is find anterior and posterior ventral and dorsal surfaces. The easiest way to do that is to look for that large, it's like you're making peanut butter cookies and you're pushing your thumb inside it. So look for that large single depression that you can push your thumb in. <coughs> that needs to be posterior, so it can receive the olecranon process. And then the next thing you're going to do, once you turn that so it's facing to the posterior aspect, facing to your back, is look for the head. So if the head is facing this direction, it's going to be a left humor. So if the head is facing this direction, it's going to be a right humor. Okay. So again, those particular steps um, I give you in um, the online lecture notes as far as how to practice. And again, note how the medial epicondyle is a much larger, more um, prominent process. So the joint surfaces on the humerus are going to be the head, the capitulum, and the trochlea. Because the humerus articulates with three bones. The scapula, the um, radius, and the ulna. All right. So looking at this bone, the scapula, is it left or right? So first of all, figure out, are you looking at the anterior facing the ribs or posterior process just under the skin? 
find the joint surface for the humerus that has to be lateral. So visualize this on the back of the person in front of you or on your own back. All right, is it gonna be turned around or you'll get an anterior posterior surface and then visualize it on the left side or the right side. So figure out which part fits. All right, and then this process up here is gonna site for muscle attachment. This is the um, spine I was telling about. It's hard to visualize that in the, without the shadow. But that's the spine. Um, so is this process here a site for joint or muscle attachment? Okay, you can just write that, the word or you can just write the letter M or J. Okay, so this may be an example of the type of couple of questions you might see on the lab exam, although one of them would probably be name the process. Is it a side of joint surface or muscle attachment? And another question would be, you know, name this bone, is it left or right? Rather than just looking at the isolated scapulae in your box and lab, also pay attention, take it over, or go over and look at the articulated skeletons where they're in place, and see which, how the posterior and anterior surfaces are related to the entire skeleton put together. <coughs> All right, so here's the joints of the elbow. So here's an anterior view. I got you on the board. Here's the radial fossa and the coronoid fossa. So when you flex the arm, the uh, radial fossa is receiving the head of the radius. Coronoid fossa is receiving this lip, if you will, the coronoid process. Posteriorly, here is the olecranon process. It just says olecranon, but I want you to say a process. Um, the arm is extended in this view, and the olecranon fossa contains the olecranon process of the humerus. So, same friend whose daughters helped my son fall, fall down the stairs. Um, their younger daughter was playing um, football, like football, and um, got tackled. She got a lot of injuries, shoulder injuries and stuff from football. But um, she hurt her elbow, fell on her elbow, and her mom took her that evening to urgent care, and they took x-rays and said, well, we don't see anything. It doesn't look like there's a fracture. And sometimes with slight fractures or stress fractures, Radiologists can't really see anything until there's some repair and there's a brightness um, because of the extra mineralization that you see in the white uh, bony area of the x-ray. So she took her home and several weeks later, her daughter was complaining that she could only close her elbow part way. So she <coughs> took her back and signed to a family physician and they took x-rays and the ulna had fractured and um, had not been put back together, so it didn't fit into the olecranon fossa, and she had to have the bone rebroken and set oh, under yeah. anesthesia. They just take a baseball oh, bat sure. to her arm, okay? But that's why that space is essential if you're going to bring your, close your um, elbow completely or extend it completely. So this would be for flexion, this would be for extension where we open up the elbow. So there's another view. So here you can see um, how the ulna fits into the um, electron process, fits into the electron process. So let's take a look at those two bones now. So these are each bones of the uh, forearm. All right, I have the question last question before we move on. So identify the position and location of the greater tubercle of the humerus. So you're gonna choose one of these two words and one of these words, all right? So is the greater tubercle on the proximal or distal end of the humerus? Is it on the anterior, posterior, lateral, or medial aspect? So choose one of those four words. So you're going to have 
either proximal or distal, and then either anterior, posterior, lateral, or medial for the greater tuberculosis. Again, if you study these bones with what you can palpate on yourself, they're relatively um, easy to figure out. Um, you know, I don't expect to see you giving yourself full body massages during the exam, but when we do the muscle, you know, people are doing this kind of thing and moving, and so it, I don't mind you. I hope I can see you feeling some structures. That's not where the greater tuberculosis is, okay? <laughs> bones of the forearm, all right? So if I ask you to identify a bone of the arm, there's only one correct answer. That would be the humerus. A bone of the forearm would be either radius or ulna. All right, now if we say identify a bone of the upper extremity, you can give me radius, ulna, humerus, or any of the bones in the hand. Okay, that entire structure is the upper extremity. In anatomical position, remember that's with the palms facing forward, the thumb is lateral, the little finger is medial. Our lateral bone is the radius. The medial bone is the ulna. So that is the hand in what we call supination, palm forward. So now if you rotate and pronate the hand, you're gonna turn the forearm and rotate the hand facing downward so the visual surface is now facing the floor. Do this with the articulated skeletons in the lab. And you'll notice that the ulna doesn't move at all. Keep the ulna entirely on the same plane. What happens is as you're rotating that, all right, the radius radiates, turns in place, and crosses over the ulna, so it's now going from here to here. And then when you go back to anatomical position, the two bones um, are in parallel without crisscrossing, all right? So um, I think I do the ulna first. The ulna is the longer bone. Um, it's easy to figure out which is anterior and which is posterior because you have this depression here that wraps around the trochlea. So that I'll diagram on the board in just a moment. That forms what's known as the trochlear notch or the semi-lunar notch. That's a joint surface. That's what's forming a movable joint with the trochlea of the humerus. Okay? So it's a, um, only in one plane, you can't take your elbow and go like this, okay? It's you're only in this one plane, so it's sometimes called a hinge joint. So here would be the coronoid process of the ulna. Palm of my hand would be this trochlear or semilunar notch, and this part would be the olecranon process. So it's gonna go like this around the trochlea as you flex and extend your elbow. There is a um, slight depression on one side, just below the notch, which receives the head of the radius. So it's gonna have a joint surface with the humerus and another joint surface with the radius. And that's kind of an oval flat surface that had hyaline cartilage known as the radial notch. Does that have to be medial or lateral? Lateral, because it's articulating with a lateral bone. So that's how you figure out whether the ulna is a left or a right ulna. Pick up the ulna, you place it so that the trochlear notch is anterior, and then you're gonna look for the radial notch. If the radial notch is on this side, on the little finger side, when you put it on your right forearm, it won't work, because that means the radius has to be over here in the air. So now if you switch it over to this bone, the right ulna of course goes on the little finger side, the medial aspect of the forearm, now the radial notch is lateral and ar can articulate with the head of the radius. Okay, so you use those processes as you're figuring out whether it's um, lateral or medial. Then down at the bottom, there's a little bump, slightly more posterior than it is uh, medial. Remember the styloid process that we had with the temporal bone? Okay, the styloid process of the ulna and the styloid process of the radius 
form a slight box shaped structure that's going to support the bones of your wrist. So if you feel on the back of your um, forearm right here, there's a bump that doesn't move when you flex and extend your hand, and that's the styloid process. All right? There's also a notch. This is called the head of the ulna, but we're not going to worry about that. So on the opposite end of the bone is the head of the radius, but you don't need to know the head of the ulna. Just you need to know the olecranon process, the trochlear notch, the coronoid process is little sharp up here, the radial notch, and then all the way down to the styloid process. Yes? So basically the, notch, the thing that attaches to the, um, the humerus? Yeah, the humerus. Forming, yeah, forming a joint surface or to each other. And then I'll diagram the radius. So we talked about the drum head of the radius. All right, that's going to be proximal. The joint surface is going to be on the top of that. We don't have a separate name for that where it articulates with the capitulum. Then we have a roughened area here. It almost looks like a knot in a tree, and I don't have a picture of the radius separately. But there's an oval rough area that's medial. That's a joint surface, the radial tuberosity. Anytime you hear tuberosity or tubercle, it's going to be a joint surface. That's where your biceps brachii attaches. All right, so that keeps pulled out and roughened because of that muscle. And then we have the long, um, styloid process here. I'm going to point out while I have the image. Notice the two surfaces down here. That's what you need to determine whether the radius is left or right. So to determine the olecranon and uh, the ulna anterior posterior surface, you're going to look at the trochlear notch. To determine whether the radius is left or right, you want to look down here near the styloid process. Notice how in the anterior surface that distal end is scooped like a flattened wooden stirring spoon, okay? That scoop, like the palm of your hand, is anterior. If you turn it over, the back of that is convex and looks like the knuckles on the back of your hand, okay? So when you see that, that's a posterior surface. If you're mashing it up to your own forearm, you need to turn your own forearm over. Otherwise, your forearm's gonna be anterior to match the anterior surface. And then the styloid process, notice it's the outside, it's gonna point to your thumb because your thumb is lateral. So if I show you a picture like this, and I say, is this a left or a right radius, and all you see is that. This happened to me my, my senior year of high school. My biology two class was a college level anatomy and physiology class. And our teacher would take a bone like this, a radius, and hang it from the ceiling with the rest of it all wrapped up. And we'd have to look up there and name the bone and name the process and whether it was left or right. I'm not gonna do that for you. You get to see the whole bone, okay? However, on the lab quiz, I might just show you that part. You don't get to see the whole bone. And say, is this a left or a right bone? So how do you figure that out? You know that this is the posterior surface. So you turn it, turn your own hand over. So you're looking at the posterior of your hand and match that up. So if I have it on this hand, okay, is that process there gonna be pointing to my thumb? It's gonna be pointing over here to my third finger, which I won't show you. All right, now if I put it on this hand on the back, now that process there is gonna be pointing to my thumb. So that's a right radius. If I see this, then I have, to pro I have to look at my own forearm with my palm up, and again, the styloid process, if I lay it on my forearm, is gonna be pointing to my thumb, okay? So all you need is just that part of it, and you can figure out whether it's left or right.
Then this cell surface is the trochlear or semilunar notch. So this is muscle. Posterior and proximal surface. This is a joint surface. Anterior and proximal. This little lip right here is the coronoid process, similar to the name that we had, or the same as the name we had in the mandible. And that's a muscle. That's a process that is used to flex your elbow. Okay? Pulls on that process. And it's going to be anterior. And then right about here, we have the, on the lateral aspect, we have the radial notch. Notice it's called radial even though it's a process of the ulna. Just like the mandibular fossa on the temporal bone was a joint surface for the mandible, but it's called the mandibular fossa. And the zygomatic process was a process of the temporal bone, all right, even though it had the name of the other bone. So you need to keep those straight. So this is a joint surface <coughs> on the ulna for the radius. And then distally, so we've got a lot of portions missing here. We have a slight, small, little uh, medial, but more posterior than medial styloid process. And then we have the radius. a lateral bone of the forearm. This will be an anterior view. So we have the head of the radius, which again kind of looks like a drum head. Joint surface. We have this bump. Like I said, it looks kind of like the knot on a tree. That's the radial tuberosity, muscle, proximal, and medial. So then as we extend downward, we're going to have this quite large styloid process, which is lateral, because it's the bump that you feel right here. So the styloid process of the radius is on the lateral aspect. The styloid process on the ulna is uh, medial and posterior. These have more ligament attachments than they actually do muscle, so I'm not going to end it, write that part down. notches and the parts that go into it. Um, is there like some sort of like tissue or any kind of Hyaline muscle? cartilage. Between the two surfaces, no, because these are, we'll talk about the first day of lecture on, th with, on Thursday next week. Okay. Yeah, next week. Uh, we'll talk about types of joints. And these are movable joints. Remember we talked about synovial membranes? Yeah. We talked about four types of membranes. There's a gap for the fluid. 
So other joints, well, like the sutural joints, will have just the collagen fibers. Mm -hmm. Or we have cartilaginous joints, like between the two bodies of a vertebra, and we have the intervertebral disc. There's no gap there. But these have a gap, which is the fluid. Okay, that leaves us with the bones of the hand which we divide into three groups. We have the carpal bones, which are the wrists. And the wrist is right here. Now we tend to think of the wrist as where we have wristbands and bracelets and um, uh, watches. And we call this the wrist, all right? But when you flex your hand, that part doesn't move at all. So that's really still the radius and ulna. So what's moving at that joint right there is the hand and that portion right there are eight bones that we call the carpal bones. Extending from the carpal bones, we have five bones that form the metacarpal. So those actually form the, what we think of mostly as the palm of the hand, right? And then we have the finger bones, which are identified as phalanges, or a single finger bone, digit bone is a phalanx, ending in an X instead of an E. So we have two rows of carpal bones, two rows of four. So one, two, three, and this bone on top of it is the fourth. So that's considered to be the proximal layer, okay, closest to the joint at the shoulder. And then the distal layer, which articulates with the metacarpal, we have one, two, three, and this is one bone with a hook on it. Right, instead of a, that's not another bone on top like that one is. So now we would have our lateral bones and our medial bones, okay? The capitate here is kind of right in the middle. So on the proximal row, starting laterally, we have the scaphoid, the lunate, the triquetral, or triquetrum, and sitting on top of it, the pisiform. And then distal row, articulating with the first metacarpal of the thumb, we have the trapezium. So the thumb right rhymes with trapezium, okay? Capitate's really easy, it doesn't look like a head, although it sounds it's right in line with the third metacarpal, and trapped between two, those two, we have the trapezoid. Because we have three bones that have TR in the beginning of the word name, so it's kind of difficult to keep those separate. So triquetral over here, then trapezium for thumb, trapped between <coughs> trapezium and capitate, we have the trapezoid. And we have capitate in line with the third metacarpal, and the hamate has a hook. And I always learned that. My dad's a minister, uh, so I grew up with stories from the New and the Old Testament. And those of you that have religious backgrounds, um, Esther is a story of Esther and Mordecai in the Old Testament, where the Jewish people were going to be um, destroyed, and uh, her brother, uh, Esther, was taken in um, by the queen, and she heard from her brother about this plot to destroy the Jews and by a man by the name of Haman. And so she went to the king to plead for the life of her people and the gallows that Haman was being built was used to hang him. So this little hook looks like a gallows and the bone is called the Hamate bone for Haman. And that's how I, that complicated reasoning is how I remember the, the name of that. But any little thing that you can quote unquote, no pun intended, hook your information on all right, will help you identify. So if you, you can find mnemonics in which you can find um, names for the letters, you know, a phrase that identifies the letters of these. But a little bit more information, I want you to be able to identify the scaphoid as a bone that the radius articulates with. So at the proximal end, the radius is going to articulate with the, the humerus through the capitulum. The radius is going to articulate with the ulna through the radial notch, not the radial tuberosity, that's the, mu uh, the muscle. And the radius is going to articulate with two bones here, the scaphoid and a little bit of the looming. Okay. The ulna articulates with the humerus at the trochlea, so the semilunar notch. It articulates with the radius via the radial notch again. And then it only articulates down here with the looming. Okay. There is an articulation between the radius and the ulna. There's notches there, but we're not going to worry about those. All right. Finally, the last point I want to bring out here is a groove is created. This is the ventral surface, so it's actually like this. Okay. There's a groove created between where the pisiform sits on top of the triquetral and the hook of the hammock. 
and that protects the ulnar nerve. You can feel those two bones right there forming a bump right here that moves when you move your wrist, so that's not the styloid process. So that bony structure there protects the ulnar nerve. And then the very last thing I want to point out is notice how each of the finger bones, digits two, three, four, and five, have three bones. We have the proximal phalanx, the middle or intermediate, and the distal. Now these have bases and heads. I don't test on those, okay? So if I ask you to identify that bone, just it's the proximal phalanx or it's the distal phalanx. So the metacarpal, first, second, third, fourth, or fifth, starting with your thumb is number one. Word of note, the thumb only has two phalanges. This is not the proximal phalanx. This is the first metacarpal. And then we have a proximal and a distal phalanx and no middle. Okay, the hands are articulated. You will not be asked to identify these bones by themselves. Okay, you'll be given them to as a articulated structure. All right, so lecture class.